Hello dear friends and here we are in the 21 day journey with Paul and Stephen. What a beautiful journey, a journey of self-discovery, a journey of your inner transformation and inner empowerment. It's a beautiful journey that was recommended by the spirit mentors of Kardec Radio, the Spirit of Southern Virginia, after the United States election. It's the opportunity for us to gather new tools, resources to know what to do in the current times. Many people are still puzzled what's going to happen next, are still struggling about the world. And this book was actually published in 1941, in the middle of the Second World War, by Chico Xavier. He was the one who psychographed it. The Brazilian Spiritist Federation published it. The spirit author is Emmanuel. Hello, Felipe. So, friends, this is an opportunity for us to meditate deeply about the current times, which is not that much different, morally speaking. We have evolved, but we still can gather from these teachings a lot of information. It's a beautiful journey. So, come with us and let us travel to exactly where Paul is at this moment. He is talking to his former friends and it's not easy. He is there in front of uh, an audience at the Sanhedrin and this is chapter 13. We're merging to chapter 14. It's about struggles and humiliations before his actual first first works with Christ. Hello, Adilson. So, friends, he is there and they want to arrest him because they see him as a traitor. Well, he is very knowledgeable. He knows about the laws and dynamics of the law. So, he asks for the warrant and it was an unexpected question. And this tells us how important it is for us also to be deeply engaged in the society where we live in. Saul of Tarsus was successful before and after because he was also totally immersed in the system where he lived in. He never left himself to live at the edges of society. He was deeply engaged, deeply knowledgeable about the laws, the dynamics of society. And that is always a plus, Andre Lewis, in a book that is already in English, Among Brothers of Other Lands, published by Eddie Say. You can find it at Amazon.com, EddieSayOfAmerica.com. And this book in its first chapter gives us important tips for spiritists who are traveling around the world. Whether you're there for a few days or traveling as a migrant for a little while or moving elsewhere, becoming an immigrant, then it's a message for all of us. Spiritist tips for spiritists who are traveling. Chapter 1 of the book Among Brothers of Other Lands in Portuguese Entre Irmãos de Outras Terras. This is a book that is a must for all of us, no matter the nationality, first and foremost, because he says, André Luiz, through Chico Xavier, that the word foreigner must be one day dissolved in the waters of fraternity. Hi, Peter Hayes. Hi, Angelita. Thank you for joining us. And here we learn with Saul of Tarsus, one of the important tools to live in the current world as well. Line one of the message by André Luiz as well in that chapter one of the book Among Brothers of Other Lands. Learn the laws, the, the legal dispositions of the country where you're living in and respect them. We need to learn and respect and be compliant to the human laws as well. When people asked Jesus about taxes, he replied, let's give Caesar what is Caesar's and God what is God's. 
meaning respect human laws and comply also with God's laws. So, when Saul of Tarsus asked this question, how can you arrest me? Do you have the paperwork? And they say, the leader of the synagogue says, well, the parchment will be presented within a few hours. Why is Emmanuel describing this to us? He's showing to us that Saul of Tarsus had important skills that we all need to have as well, which is this knowledge about the legal dispositions of our society. We need to understand. We can't play ignorant. We, if we're moving to a new country, we better understand about the laws, we better understand about how the system works, we live better. And did you know that even sociology, many papers, we have studied it, many papers already show that those who speak more fluently the language of the country where they live in, they have better self-esteem. So when we talk about this, we are talking about helping every single migrant we have, we encounter. Because we can tell them that keeping yourself, my friend, in the little circles of your friendships from your national is not going to help you. Your self-esteem is going to be better if you get to know the language of the country where you live in. This is a matter of love, of kindness. And it's also for us spiritists a matter of mental health, spiritual health. The higher the self-esteem, the better the mental health and spiritual health because obsession can only take place in a mental environment where we lack self-love and love for others and love for God. Where there is greater levels of self-love, we can easily open our hearts to others and open our hearts to God. So, giving new tools for people to know the legal dispositions of the country, where they live in, just like Saul of Tarsus, make them feel encouraged, empowered, determined, so much so, that Saul looked at the leader of the synagogue in the eye, and addressing the assembly, which surprised and was marveled, had taken note of his moral courage. You see, we have moral courage when we are deeply engaged into our society, right? And he stated loudly and clearly, Men of Israel, I brought to your souls the best I have to offer. But you refused the truth, exchanging it for outward formalities. I do not condemn you. I feel sorry for you. Because I too used to be as you are. However, when my time came, I did not refuse the general's help that heaven offered me. So, a deep silence followed. Everybody was marveled. They were astonished. They couldn't say a word. They were speechless. Nobody. I know you because I have trod such paths. However, let us admit that Phariseeism has caused our loss by casting our most sacred hopes into an ocean of hypocrisy. You revere Moses in the synagogue. You're excessively careful with outward conventions. Remember when we talked yesterday? We are excessively worried about outward conventions. We spiritists cannot do that. More concerned about putting together events, more concerned about the outs, outward conventions. No, no, no. We need to focus on Jesus' teachings, which is the inner and the outreach, charity. No wonder, no wonder, no wonder, Jesus came to us in the conclusions in the gospel according to Spiritism. Without charity, there is no salvation. Saul learned his lesson without charity. There's no salvation. So he goes on and says, You can arrest me, for the word of God is not bound by shackles. If you yourselves reject it, there are others who will understand me. 
It will not be right to surrender myself to your caprices when the work I must do requires my dedication and goodwill. I, Fernanda, even the leaders of the meeting seem spellbound by powerful and inexplicable magnetic powers. Saul looked intently at them one by one, revealing the strength of his powerful character. Your silence speak louder than words, he concluded almost early. See his courage, his strength. Jesus will not permit you to arrest his humble and loyal servant. Having said that, he walked out of the synagogue. Everybody was startled, watching him. He disappeared into the narrow streets, and nobody did anything. Afterwards, as if awakening from... The daring challenge, the meeting degenerated into a heated argument. They discussed about what to do. They have to arrest that man. Remember, my friends, yesterday, Saul was there persecuting. Now he's being persecuted. This is another lesson for us. Today, we may create dissensions. We may have gatherings to create plots against people. But remember, tomorrow we have created a monster that is going to come after us. That's the law of life. Action and reaction. Action and reaction. Today, you may look at people who are in power thinking, oh my God, how come they're doing this and what's going to happen? Don't worry. The monster we create is going to come after us. Right? Hi, Hercules. So what is being asked from us as spiritists? Fraternity. Solidarity. So right now, the first quiz of the day, because this book is for us as inner transformation. How much are we creating monsters in our lives? in a daily basis, by gossiping, by creating dissensions where we are supposed to create unity, like Saint Francis of, the, of Assisi, he says, where there is discord, let me bring unity. And unity is not an external, it's not an outward convention. It doesn't come from the outside in. It comes from the inside out. What are we doing to create brotherhood feelings, fraternal feelings? Hi, Marina. So we need to ask ourselves, this is the first quiz of the day. How much are we focused on a daily basis on creating this little discord that later going to turn against us. Sometimes in our own families. You know those little comments people make? Little spicy, like, ah, that person, I'm not so sure. And then everybody is resistant to that person. We wonder why. And we think that today we are not being the center of those plots, but tomorrow he comes back to us, like a boomerang. And that's exactly what happens. Action and reaction. Action and reaction. Everything is passing and temporary in terms of human power. Remember Pontius Pilate? He thought he had power in his hands. He couldn't foresee that soon after he was going to be taken away from that power. And he couldn't take the pressure, the spiritual, the moral pressure, he quit his own life. Action and reaction. The monsters he created came after him. And that's how it is. Now Saul is going to feel the effects of the waves of hatred he created himself. He created a vortex of 
rebelliousness and hatred that is now coming after him. As for Saul, upon leaving the synagogue, he anxiously looked after Ananias for caring advice. What a wise man. He never played like all by myself type of attitude. He knew we are always team working. We need one another. We need friends. We need each other. Good morning, my friend Vanessa. Beautiful, beautiful Vanessa who helps us so much every Thursday at Cardiac Radio. Thank you. The wise old man listened to his account and said, Hmm. Saul said, You know, I know the master condemned arguing Ananias and never associated with contentious persons, but he also never gave in to evil. I'm ready to repair my wrongful past. And he thinks, would I be serving the master by bow bowing my head to lower ideals? Jesus struggled against them as much as possible. His disciples cannot do otherwise. The kind old man nodded as he listened to what Saul was saying. After reassuring him of his approval, he advised him to be very careful. Be courageous is one thing, but we can't lack the need of balance, prudence. It would be better to leave his hideout as soon as possible. The Jews in Damascus knew the part Ananias had played in healing Saul and they would come after him. Saul accepted the advice without hesitation and within, you see, it's always like three hours, three days, three years, <laughs> I don't know, just observe. Within three hours, old Ananias was sought out and interrogated. But he, re he replied, Saul must be with Jesus. Saul left. And meanwhile, Ananias was imprisoned and he was denied communication for 24 hours. He received 20 blows, leaving his face and hands badly hurt. It hurts to read it. It hurts to read how ignorant we can be. But don't we do the same? Ananias was mining his life. He was sharing what he has received, the treasure of the gospel. But for those Pharisees, they took it so personal. They thought Ananias wanted to show himself off. He wanted to be a revolutionary. He wanted to go against their system. And they were hurting him. The question is for us, are we doing the same? Because we often, like the Pharisees of the time, we think that the greatest actions of kindness and charity must come from somebody else. Or from us. If somebody else dares it, they are wrong. And we may not beat them up physically, but we do with our words. Killing their image, always. I remember somebody who was in an organization at work and this person was threatened by a young man who seemed to be quite uh, innovative and very skillful and the gossip went around like saying oh this young man is a troublemaker 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 so people who didn't know the young man started feeling resistant to him because all they heard is that the boss of the company was telling that person is a troublemaker, troublemaker. Little by little, the young man had narrower, narrower um, pathways to play his role and create innovations. Why? Gossip. We're not beating the man up physically, but his image is being killed by the other person. We better not be the person who is doing this. Well, one thing we know, Ananias was released afterwards. He met a soul again and he said cheerfully, you see, after all he went through, 
he didn't feel like he was he was being beaten up because of so he understood he was given to Jesus as a worker so he didn't take it personal he didn't blame it on soul leader which is quite interesting I Valeri and Joyce so he met a uh, soul and cheerfully it's amazing his hands are hurting the feet are hurting but he's cheerful and says so when I was a child I watched a man escape over the walls of Jerusalem. So, would you be afraid of escaping in a wicker basket? You see, when we are truly aligned with Jesus, even in the most challenging times, we cheer up. We rejoice, even in the greatest challenges. Look at, let's listen and feel the dialogue. But let us contextualize. They are being persecuted, that's not fun. But he was just beaten up and he's an old man, Ananias. Saul is younger, but he's being persecuted. Life has changed completely. Let's remember zero comfort in their lives, physically speaking. But they meet again and cheerfully, Ananias comes. We can almost see it, right? How he is giving us this lesson about being cheerful in spite of the challenges and on the contrary he was actually being cheerful like enjoying the adventures of the challenges and they are not crazy they are not like ooh, going bananas with the situation they are just enjoying jesus opportunity to serve and he said, so, remember, again, another chapter, a parenthesis here, before I forget, Mentor Joseph is reminding us, every chapter about childhood, remember, Ananias recalled an important passage from his childhood, and now it's serving a purpose to help them out, and especially so at this time, and helping all of us too, because we benefited from there efforts. So, would you be afraid of escaping in a wicker basket? And Saul asked, smiling, friends, these are two men, two, not four, two. Oh, there are good spirits with them, of course. But in spite of the challenge, they are cheering, they are smiling. What a lesson for us. Thank you, Emmanuel, for bringing to us these lessons of emotional intelligence we haven't seen before, we haven't noticed. Lessons of emotional intelligence. The Pharisees' emotions are theirs. I'm not going to be contaminated by theirs. Leave them alone. We're rejoicing because we are in this quest for love. So that's why Ananias, truly, truly in sync with Jesus, he can be cheerful, and that's why now our dear soul is smiling. And he says, why would I be? Didn't Moses begin life in a basket upon waters? Beautiful reference, smiling. You see, Jesus said, if you come with me, life's going to be easier. Inside. And outside, tricky, but inside, easy. Because now we understand. Now we know. Even the challenges, okay, we're going to figure it out together. You see the teamwork effort here? Always teamwork. Always teamwork. Are you welcoming the team players in your life? Or are we just like toddlers playing all by ourselves? You know, they are learning how to play with one another. Are we still like toddlers? I want to do all by myself. So was like that. Now he's learning about the power of team working, not only in the spirit centers, in the churches, the temples, but in our daily lives. We cook, we eat, we clean, we work together. We are with one another in the struggles of life. Don't be ashamed by the challenges. Join with your friends and welcome them in your life and share without shame 
Because you know, when we go through problems, life is presenting us opportunities to overcome our ego. And humility, step one for humility, welcoming our friends, true friends in our lives without shame. Because when we go through challenges, we are learning together, never alone. So, believe it or not, <laughs> the old man was pleased with the comparison and revealed his plan. His plan. The former rabbi felt immense joy. I don't believe this soul of Tarsus. He is fascinating. What a man. He was ready to begin his journey to Jerusalem in a basket and he felt immense joy. What a lesson for us. So kissed Ananias' hands, nearly in tears. We see the man who changed already. He became true to his feelings. Emotional intelligence. His emotional intelligence is escalating. He is not afraid of being coherent, of being congruent. When we are amongst true friends, we rejoice. And when we come to good solutions, we're, we're joyfully, cheerfully in those moments, and we may cry out of joy. He whispered a goodbye to his friends while one of them gave him a large pack of barley cakes. Mm -hmm. He went through his journey. The journey was difficult and arduous. He was compelled to stop many times because of fatigue. More than once on the hard trip, he had to turn to charity of others. The travel from Damascus to Jerusalem by camel, horse, or dromedary took no less than a week of exhausting ride. But Saul, however, was on foot. Hi, Patricia. Thank you for sharing it. It's very important. He could perhaps join up with some caravan, whereas he could get the resources he needed, but he preferred to acquaint his powerful will with the hardest ob obstacles. Whenever fatigue and other lessons suggested that he wait for the help of others to arrive, he would try to overcome his discouragement and get up again, supported by an improvised walking stick. So he created his own mechanism to encourage himself, which is vital. Some people say, I want to help others. But first and foremost, we need to learn to help ourselves. If I'm not able to help myself through my own difficulties, how am I going to be able to reach out to others? No wonder Jesus said, we can only love others when we love ourselves. We love others, but we need to love ourselves first. It can happen simultaneously because it's almost automatic. But we need to focus on that. People ask, how can I love more? By loving ourselves as children of God. Let's not forget, we are God's painting. We are God's masterpiece. And if we don't appreciate ourselves, how are we going to appreciate everything else? So we need to appreciate God within us so we can recognize it in everyone. When we recognize God in us, we become humble because we know everybody is made of the same elements and is made from the same love, right? Yeah. He arrived in Capernaum. There was a golden sunset cast an enchanting light over the bucolic countryside. We love these descriptions. So poetic. The former rabbi walked down reverently to the shores of the lake. Now Emmanuel is going to describe to us that he's going to meet every single place where Jesus was with his disciples. He became enraptured as he contemplated the lapping waters, thinking of Jesus, of the power of Jesus' love. He wept, overcome by a singular emotion. 
Think about this, friends. Somebody who came to us and still is with us for true love, unconditional love. We cannot tell ever again we're lonely. Never ever we're abandoned because at least we know Jesus is with us, has always been and always will be. And with him we know that God is with us, sustains us and leads us each and every day to a new journey. He feels good. He wished he had been a humble fisherman in order to have received the sublime teachings at the source of his kind and immortal words. So stayed there for two days in gentle rapture. Without revealing who he was, he looked for Levi, he who welcomed him with delight. So Levi shows Capernaum, shows the place where he used to work when Jesus approached him and invited him to come with him. He talked about Jesus. And then later, later, he, he also went to Dalmanutha where he met Mary Magdalene. That was a big deal. For a man of his time, my friends, to go after one woman and learn from her, here we have the recording. What a man. What a man. He enriched the impressive extent of his observations with the gathering of new information when he met Mary Magdalene. A few days later, after resting in Nazareth, Saul was at the gates of the holy city of the Israelites, exhausted and fatigued. From the long and arduous walk, walk, friends, he was walking. In Jerusalem, however, other no less painful surprises awaited him. He was gripped by anxious questions. Who was going to receive him? Where would he go? He needed an inn, so he actually first stopped by at his sister's home, Delilah. The man looked at him and was like, who are you? You're just a beggar. Go away. Get lost, he said. And he understood that Delilah didn't live there either. He looked for Alexander, his friend. And Alexander was excited until he got to know that Saul was still connected to Jesus' teachings. And he said, you know, uh, until you are like this, you better go away. You better go live your life. Well, he was humiliated, said Emmanuel, but he had nothing else but just to learn that his mother died out of um, shame because of the son. And these are precise words. I'm going to actually read this passage to you because let us feel what Saul is feeling. He's trying to find places to find himself in a new pathway. And that's the journey of all of us. Once we change, we go back to the same old relationships and we may be surprised by changes we unexpected, we didn't expect. So his friend arrogantly said, your illness has upset your whole family. Jacob and Delilah were ashamed at hearing the news from Syria and moved from Jerusalem to Cilicia. When your mother learned of the Sanhedrin's order to arrest you, she died in Tarsus. Can you imagine how he felt learning that his mother died after her hearing about his changes? Your father, who educated you so carefully, expected your mind to glean the highest honors of the Jewish people. He spent his days downcast and unhappy, tired of enduring the people's sarcasm in Jerusalem. Your friends have become withdrawn and humiliated after having looked for you without success. Doesn't such a picture pain you? 
Wouldn't such heartache as this be enough for you to come to your senses? The former doctor of the law's heart was stricken with anguish. So many anxious days. So much bitterness in hopes of re regaining some understanding and rest with his loved ones. But he now saw that he had been in all illusion and ruin. His family had fallen apart. His mother was dead. His father unhappy. His friends hated him. Jerusalem mocked him. Seeing so in such a state of affairs, his friend was happy inside, anxiously anticipating the effect of such words. Question, what kind of friend is this? Right? That gives you a glass of poison and smiles thinking that you're going to drink and do what? After thinking for a minute, Saul pointed out. I'm sorry for such sad consequences. And God is my witness. I do not mean for this to happen. I did not mean for this to happen. However, according to the old law, even those who have not accepted gospel should understand that we must not be proud. Despite the force of his commandments, Moses taught goodness. The prophets who succeeded him were emissaries of profound messages for our souls, which had become lost in iniquity. Amos urged us to search for the Lord so that we might live. I am sorry that my loved ones felt offended, but we must remember that before listening to any idle worldly judgment, we must seek the judgments of God. Thank you, soul of Tarsus, for your emotional intelligence and spiritual intelligence, because he didn't take his family's feelings, facts, personally. He didn't give up his journey because his family didn't understand his choices. He loves them, but he understood that he must follow God. And Alexander, almost hostile, asked, Do you mean to persist in your errors? I do not feel I am in error. Owing to this widespread misunderstanding, I am too in a painful situation, but the master will not withhold his aid. I remember him and experienced great comfort. That's the test for us. If people around us do not understand us, they think we are wrong, we're fanatics, etc., but we are doing the good and they feel hostile towards us. Leave them alone. He says, I will, he says clearly, ever since my childhood, I have tried to fulfill my duties without wavering. But if I must resort to the balance of my wealth in order to reach Jesus' light, I will renounce the esteem of the world itself. Beautiful. The esteem of the world, what is that for? If the world is not balanced. He got it and he said, if I have to renounce, I will. Well, the thing is that he was now in silence, great, humiliated before his friend Alexander, who is no longer a friend, of course. So understood the warning because Alexander said, if you keep going this way, bye-bye, uh, until later. He said, I'll be at your disposal at any time should you decide to change your attitude. Thank you, Alexander, because true friends do not have conditions. They embrace you and your life completely. Thank you. So, as wise as he is, he said, thank you very much, and left. Two minutes later, so was back in the streets. It was almost noon, almost noon. It's, you see, the truth comes 
and shines upon us and it's very deep very deep he remembered his friend Sadok and you know he tried to search for his father and later later he'll find his father for now for now he's in Jerusalem and he thinks, well, if my friends, my companions, my families don't understand, my family doesn't understand me, I am in Jerusalem, I better go to the house of Peter. They are going to understand me, right? Will they? I'm not so sure. Prophers, one of the helpers of the house of the way, opened and humbly said, Brother, could you please tell me? Uh, Saul asked him if Peter is in. He says, I'll check. If he is, please tell him that Saul of Tarsus wishes to speak with him in Jesus' name. Ay, 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 what happens next? Everybody's like emotion there. Everybody's like, oh my God, Saul of Tarsus. Has he really changed? Or has he come here to play a trick on us? And Peter gives us a lesson. Okay? That's the second major lesson of the day for us. Peter asked with deep understanding to his companions, how can we find out if Saul of Tarsus has really changed? Our proof lies in Saul himself. He is in the field that will either reveal or not reveal the sacred seedling of the master. In my opinion, now let's learn from Simon Peter. Since we are in charge of a legacy that does not belong to us personally, we must proceed in accordance with human prudence. Aha, aha, it would not be right to open our doors when we do not know his intentions. The first time he came here, Saul of Tarsus was treated with all the respect that the world accorded him. I offered the best seat for him to listen to Stephen. Unfortunately, his disrespectful and sarcastic attitude caused a scandal that ended in the imprisonment and death of a friend. I must not forget that the master's lesson regarding forgiveness, and so I would reaffirm the fact that I'm not thinking only of ourselves, but the responsibilities that have been entrusted to us. And he continued, after a brief silence, Despite my willingness to do so, I cannot allow him to be received into this house without making a better study of the situation. That said, I shall call a meeting for tonight. The matter is very grave. Saul of Tarsus was the first persecutor of the gospel, and I want everyone's help in deciding what to do. I do not want to seem unjust or imprudent go tell him to come back later that i cannot leave more urgent matters for the time being what if he insists the other asked if he has in fact come in the name of jesus he will understand and wait stop pause lesson for our daily lives in the current times and this can be easily bridged up with a chapter in the book Not Solar 2, Prudence. When a spirit who is tormented knocks on the gates of Not Solar, a woman, she seems to be ill and in need of help. And Andrea Luis learns that if they open the doors of Not Solar, her disturbance is going to create greater disturbance in the colony. When they say no to her, she reveals herself. Unlike so, for us, a matter of prudence in our daily lives. Of course, forgiveness is vital, but it's not about forgiveness. It's about being prudent. It's about being prudent that we don't allow people who created disturbances to keep creating disturbances. We're not going to say we're going to push away people, but we're going to give them time to re-enter our homes 
in our lives. For spirit centers, this is a major lesson. A major lesson for us. Once people have created problems, we need to what? Know that we're in charge of a legacy that does not does not belong to us personally. In the spirit center, that legacy is not ours. We cannot risk it. Sometimes we need to turn down somebody to keep the harmony of the group. Exactly. And if we are the person who is disturbing, so be it. But we can't put the harmony at risk with the so-called imprudent embracing. Yeah, everybody comes and people say, Oh, but I've been a medium here and there in many centers. And my friend, sit and wait, meditate, study with us. When the time is right, you're going to join us in this other service. That's how it is. And if we are humble enough, we're going to learn to wait. Because we are always with Christ, in or inside any doors. In or outside. Okay? Human prudence because the legacy is not ours. In the spirit centers, the legacy is not ours. I would uh, uh, recommend to everybody who is in the spirit center, read the bylaws of the Spirit Society of Paris, the Parisian Studies of Spirit Society, Kardec. In the medium's book, the last chapter, there Kardec says quite clearly, if we need to keep the harmony and be prudent, just like Peter. Be prudent. We need to learn what prudence is. So of Tarsus was already aligned. He said, I understand, brother. Peter is right. I already have the master. The master's introduction. How so? asks Prochorus. Jesus told me in Damascus that he would show me how much I must suffer for the love of his name. Beautiful surrender. Good spiritist workers are like this, peaceful. Oh, but they turn me down. Wait, wait. Jesus is with us. Jesus is pointing the the, the, the steps to us, we can only be faithful and wait. Deep down, the former rabbi was homesick of the brothers of Damascus who treated him with greatest simplicity. Well, he then went to an inn and awaited. Peter had a meeting. And we have the whole discussion of the group here, okay? And we learn a beautiful lesson, that of fraternal cooperation. The master taught us, said Peter, that no worthwhile work can be done on earth without fraternal cooperation. We need one another to do good works. It's true that Jesus warned us to be aware the leaving of the Pharisees and stated that disciples should be gentle as doves, but wise as serpents. Let us consider the possibility that Saul of Tarsus could in fact be the symbolic wolf. If we are involved in a labor of peace and love, what are we to do with the wolf after having identified it? Kill it? We know that it isn't in our line of conduct. Wouldn't it be more reasonable to think of the possibility of taming it? We know that unrefined men can tame ferocious dogs. So where would be the spirit that Jesus bequeathed to us as sacred legacy if out of petty fear we didn't practice goodness? Ha ha! Second quiz, second quiz, second quiz for the inner transformation. Fear. Are we allowing petty fear to create obstacles for our practice of goodness? 
question, are we allowing little types of fear in our life to create roadblocks for the expression of goodness? Fear being rejected. For example, I'm not going to say anything beautiful to this person because what if they think I'm silly? Fear being rejected of being silly. Uh, what if I, I do this and the person doesn't recognize my effort? It's the fear of the ego, right? Of not being rewarded. Uh huh. Are we allowing this type of fears to take place in our lives and creating obstacles to our practice of goodness? In our daily lives, being benevolent towards everyone without hesitation? without resistance. Hi, Rosandro. So here, friends, we have a beautiful emotional lesson for us. Peter is inviting us to see first the wolf within and then the external. In this U.S. post-election times, fear is everywhere. No, we're not going to allow it to conquer our hearts. Why? Because soul is teaching us, we have Jesus. Peter is teaching us, we have Jesus. So we are welcoming what? Goodness, shielding us from fear. Let us remember in the book No Solar by Andrea Lewis. Fear is very, very toxic and it's contagious the most contagious negative emotion. But love overcomes it. Goodness overcomes it. Let us remember of the courage of the souls who have Christ in themselves. Peter's concise speech had a remarkable effect. James himself seemed ashamed of his initial thoughts. Nicholas searched in vain for further objections. Observing the heavy silence that had set in, Peter concluded calmly. You see, two different Peters, one before Jesus discarnated, and another afterwards. He learned a lesson. He was in this beautiful discussion, but with calmness. Do we know how to have important conversations like this with calmness? How often we have exchanged of point of views and we become like <gasps> easy, calm, it's not a battle. Therefore, my friends, I propose that we appoint Barnabas to visit Saul personally in the name of this house. He and Saul do not know each other. Look how emotionally and spiritually intelligent Peter is which is an advantage, since upon seeing Barnabas, Saul will have nothing to remind him of the past in Jerusalem. How beautiful and charitable. He is being kind and careful towards Saul. And John applauded the idea enthusiastically. And there goes our dear friend Barnabas. He knocks at the inn where Saul is staying, and they chat. They talk to one another. And later, Barnabas brings Saul to Peter's home. And Peter is moved. Brother Saul, Jesus welcomes you to this house. And you know, as we see Saul getting into the house of the way and being received with kindness, I want to ask all of us a question. We see how when we are truly coherent with Jesus' teachings, we are one. We're not split. It's not about making face, but we become authentic. Like Peter, he sees Saul coming in and he's moved. Why? He is now one with his emotions, his thoughts, his actions and his words. He's coherent. He's congruent. His emotional body language and his language are one. Are we one 
or are we constantly splitted? When we go to spirit centers, when we go anywhere, we don't need to put a mask, but to be ourselves. To be ourselves, but be one with ourselves. Be attentive of the defense mechanisms. He knows he doesn't need to defend himself. He knows he's open to soul. He embraces him and he feels the emotion and allows it to be externalized. So, he learns about everything, okay? And he asks if it's possible for him to sleep on the same bed that Stephen had slept in. Barnabas and Peter are greatly moved. They had all agreed not to mention the preacher, to mention the preacher who had been slain under a hail of mockery and stones. They did not want to bring up the past in front of the Damascus convert, even if his attitude turned out not to be sincere. That's amazing. How charitable. Leave the past alone. When we are truly charitable, we do not go back and say, you see, remember, you killed Stephen. He used to sleep here. That's not charity. That's not charity. Remember, you stoned him. That These are the parchments he used to read. By the way, we cannot be sarcastic any longer. Hi, Francisca, be kiss to her mean. Right? A new, a new member of our family. By the way, friends, every Wednesday at Kardec Radio, Francisca Kranz with her baby Hermine and Mackenzie Mello. Francisca is in Germany, Mackenzie Mello in Massachusetts, United States. But they find a way every Wednesday to share with us Andrea Lewis books at Kardec Radio. You can listen to Kardec Radio at Tuning Radio. Did you know it? Even live. Tuning Radio. We have a Kardec Radio channel there. You can listen to us after the programs uh, through iTunes, kardecradio.com, blogtalkradio.com, etc. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Now, what we need to know here is that he stays there but, 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 how is this going to go on and on? He says, you know, I personally, says Peter to Saul, I don't think it's wise for you to stay in Jerusalem now, because to be frank with you, you must view the new state of your soul as a precious plant that has just begun to sprout. We also need to be careful with the new plant that is sprouting inside of us and not expose us to difficult situations in life, okay? So when the new us is coming about, let us avoid struggles, let us avoid encounters that are going to be very challenging, because Emmanuel used to say to Chico Xavier that it is also charity to avoid frictions. Avoiding frictions is charity too, right? Yes, it is. As we are wrapping up this part of the chapter, you know, these chapters we're working upon are the longest. Are the longest. And we know we are not in a rush. Don't worry. Our 21 days will be fulfilled as is. But in these beautiful two chapters, they are the longest about the struggles and the first apostolic endeavors. They have 64 pages each. They are the most uh, impacting parts of this book in many ways. So he says, why don't you go back to your home city, Tarsus? Maybe there you're going to find in your father a possibility, you know, of beginning anew. He goes there. He goes there. But he later gets to know that uh, it's not going to be easy. He has to begin anew, and I'm just going straight to the point here, where he has to learn a new life. A life in which he is counting on his 
inner strength. One day before he goes, he participates in a meeting in the Church of the Way in Jerusalem. And we can't forget that he also learns many lessons. Lessons in which he verifies that we need to keep ourselves true to the message of Jesus. Remember, the Pharisees were occupying themselves with outward conventions. We now, with Jesus, are focused on the inward dispositions. So, it's a test for us, the third quiz of the day. These are the two boundaries, okay? The inward dispositions of the soul, the outward conventions. Are we, in a daily basis, walking more towards outward conventions or focusing on inward dispositions? Outward conventions, inward dispositions. Expecting people's approval and rewards or expecting that God's going to approve of us and our conscience is going to approve of us. For us as spiritists, we need to walk ding, 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 here, inward dispositions. Again, da, na, na, na. daily, God's approval, our conscience approval, God's approval, and our conscience approval. I'm making these gestures as visuals for us. We need, for centuries we've been here, playing with outward conventions and expecting people's applause and feeling good if people are applauding us, feeling bad when people are not accepting us. Over with it. Once we find the pathway with Jesus, it's not about the outer, it's about the inner. And the inner is about the encounter with God and the God within us. That's a major lesson for us that so encountered here in the pathway of his new self. He's finding himself and he says clearly that the best position in life is one of balance. He says... He learns that lesson and is teaching us very importantly that we need also to find that inner balance, that inner balance. He learns that he can't stay there with the friends in Jerusalem and he's heading to Tarsus. He reached the first streets of Tarsus with a heavy heart. The memories came in succession without stopping. He knocked the door of his father and his father looked at him and is shocked. How could it be that my eyes deceive me? Saul embraced his father with affection, but Isaac sat down and tried to look into his son's inner being with a penetrating gaze. He asked in a tone of criticism, could it, be re it really be that you have been healed? To solve such a question was not another wounding, was yet another wounding blow to his affectionate sensibility. He felt tired, defeated, disillusioned. He needed courage to begin anew his life of higher idealism, yet, even his own father reproved him with absurd questions. He says, my father, have pity and welcome me. I've never been ill. My spirit is now in need. I do not th think I can start over in life without some rest first. Please help me out. Please help me out. Now, again, again and again, lessons of parenthood. The parenthood, the ego of the father is blinding him and is not allowing him to be compassionate toward his son. His father's austerity could not open his heart to his son. Remember when Ananias said to us that we have children to learn compassion? 
soul's father's his ego is not allowing his compassion to blossom to higher levels. He's not. And, and our dear Emmanuel is teaching us lessons of emotional management here. Emotion, emotional wisdom. He's monitoring the emotions of soul and the emotions of others. He's teaching us how to identify emotions. Even science explains to us that we only move to higher levels of emotional uh, management when we identify emotions. So he's giving us emotions. He was feeling tired, defeated, disillusioned. He was sensitive. And he's asking for his father's help. His father firmly, solemnly, and without compassion said, You were never ill? Then what was the meaning of that sad comedy in Damascus? Friends, Saul could face several armed men without losing the unbashed courage that marked his disposition. He could reproach the condemnable behavior of others. He could see it on the most frightening tribunals for the examination of human hypocrisy. But before that old man, he was unable to be renewed in his faith. And considering the breath of his sacred paternal feelings, he did not react and began to weep. The old man, his father, asked dryly, You weep? I was never the example of such cowardice. My friends, my friends, we keep telling again and again, Saul's father didn't know what we already know, proved by science, both the traditional science and the spiritual science. The voice of parents is striking to the children before you say anything to your child. Please meditate. Because it echoes in their self-esteem, in their growing self-esteem. Please, please, please. Saul of Tarsus is a grown-up man. But Emmanuel is showing to us another lesson in parenthood. No matter if your child is a grown-up, what you say is different for them. The world can say the same words, but when it comes from the parents, it sounds different. Let us be compassionate. And we have people who to date tell their children, don't cry because that's coward. That's weakness. Actually, we would turn to this parent and say, you are a coward when you say this. You are a coward. Because that child of yours is simply expressing emotions. But you do not have the courage to face them. That's why you're putting them down. Exactly. We can't do this. And unfortunately, Emmanuel says here to us that in the face of those unjust accusations, the young Tarsian sobbed, perhaps for the first time in his life. He sobbed. Can you feel it? Sobbing. His father was not reaching out to him. We need to feel it. Emmanuel purposefully is therapeutically treating us here. He is. He's treating us here through Saul of Tarsus. And on hearing those uncalled for remarks about Abigail, because then, believe it or not, his father is accusing Abigail, whom he never met, of being the cause of this new status of his son. Saul recovered his courage and murmured humbly, My father, that creature was a saint. 
God did not will for her to continue in this world. Perhaps if she were still alive, my mind would be better balanced for harmonizing my new life. His father did not like his response, although the objection had been made in a tone of obedience and love. New life? He said angrily. What do you mean by that? So, with his tears, and answered resignedly, I mean that that occurred, that what occurred in Damascus was not an illusion, and that Jesus had changed my life. Can't you see the utter, mad utter madness in all this? Impossible. How can you forsake the love of your family? Saul understood the mental suffering conveyed in his father's words. He wanted to throw himself into his loving arms. That's all children want from parents, to hug them. If parents just knew it, that that's all they want. If they just knew it, they would overcome the distance between their hearts just by hugging them. No wonder Jesus gave us arms. God gives us arms. And I say Jesus figuratively because of our planet Earth and his governance. But God gives us arms so we could, as bridges, you know, diminish the distance between us, the abyss between us. As we are wrapping up this beautiful chapter, his father simply says to him, go away. You have made your choice. You shall have nothing more to do with this house. The old man was trembling. It was probably very hard for him too. One could see how much intense spiritual effort he had taken to make that decision. Brought up in the stringent concepts of the law of Moses, Isaac was suffering as a father. Thank you, Emmanuel, to show that this father is also suffering. Nonetheless, he was throwing his son out, the depositary of so many hopes. As if he were fulfilling a duty, his loving heart suggested mercy, but his reasoning as a man held him prisoner in the implacable Jewish dogmas that stifled his natural impulse. Conflict, existential conflicts. Outward conventions, inward dispositions. Outward conventions say, your son is against the law of Moses. Inward dispositions, love your son. He chose, Isaac chose the outward convention. How many lives have we done this? How many? Many? Hopefully, not this one. So contemplated his father in a silent and supplicating attitude. His home had been his last hope. And he says, I have nothing, my father. I am tired and ill. I have no money. I need the mercy of others. He asked, would you add it by throwing me out? Isaac felt soul's appeal vibrating his innermost being, but perhaps deeming that firmness was more effective than tenderness in this case, he answered dryly, Rephrase that, because no one is throwing you out. You yourself have completely deserted your friends and purest affections. You are in need. It's only right then that you ask the carpenter for what you need. He who committed such absurdities ought to be powerful enough to help you. Immense grief gripped the, reform, the former rabbi's spirit. He was on his own. Then goodbye, Father, you have spoken rightly, for I am sure the Messiah will not abandon me. He went outdoors and he took a last gla a glance at the house. He could no longer see his father. The father servant came along and said, your father wishes to give you this money as a remembrance.
how much do we sacrifice love for family, for friends, for colleagues because of conventions, my friends? We have done this for so long. Enough is enough. Outward conventions for many lives, inward dispositions. Let us walk with courage the journey to this God within us and never be afraid or humiliated for opening our hearts to people in our lives, especially those who are closer to us. Hello, Andre Lewis. So, he is on his own. He's meditating. He's anguished. For the first time himself, he is recalling in deep anguish. He's ex extremely exhausted. He had knocked at the door to Church of the Way. He couldn't stay there. Now, he was rejected by his father. He was now beginning to grasp the fact that starting life over did not mean returning to the activities of his former home. You see, Jesus invited him and said, I'm going to tell you what to do. But he didn't come and tell you, map, you're going to do this, that and the other. No. Jesus invited him, remember? As he's inviting us every day. And we have to make our own effort and our own discoveries. We're never alone. But we need to make the effort ourselves. Jesus himself invited him, but he gave room for Saul to find his own choices at each door that is closing. He needs to search for another open door. This door is closed. Go to another door. Many people, they stay depressed. Ah, oh, that door is closed. No, no, no. Well, this door is closed. Jesus is going to show me another one. Boom. Closed. Another one. Boom. And another. And another. Now he realizes. Well, I am going to restart not as a former rabbi and not at home. It meant beginning an inner effort from the depths of his soul, forgetting the smallest vestige of the past. In other words, say Emmanuel, to become a different man all together. Are we ready? Are we ready to begin anew? Outward conventions gone, Psst. inward dispositions. That's our new reference. That's our new reference. He began to understand his new situation, but he could not stop the tears that flowed in streams from his eyes. When he finally came to, the night had fallen completely. He found a cave to stay in. He had no place. He was in the cave of his inner self. If we don't do this inner journey, the inner cave is dark and we need the light of the stars to find a little bit of illumination. The stars that guide us, the, God, the star of God. He himself, as comfortable as he could be in the rocks, afraid the lead, to leave the friendly signs of nature, he was there in fervent prayer. He stopped weeping and it seemed to him that a higher unseen power was soothing the wounds of his oppressed soul. Soon in the sweet quietude of his pained mind he felt sleep overcome. A gentle sensation of repose provided him with great relief. Was he sleeping? He had the impression of having entered a delightful dreamland. He felt agile and happy, as if he had been taken to an open field touched by springtime light. Separate and far from this world, 
lush, brilliant flowers, as if made of colorful powder, blossomed along marvelous roads in a region bathed in indefinable light. Everything spoke to him of a different world. Gentle harmonies were sounding in his ears, somewhat like a cavatina being played far away on divine harps and lutes. He wanted to identify the landscape, to define its contours and to enrich his observations but a profound sentiment of peace had overpowered him completely. He must have entered a marvelous kingdom, for the spiritual wonders that were opening to his eyes were beyond all comprehension. You see, that's our journey. We travel within ourselves, the caves of our inner selves, but in prayer we make the connection. We get into this beautiful world within and he's open now in trends we would say in a mediumistic trends he had barely awakened from his rapture when he was taken by a new surprise of someone walking softly toward him who is he who is she in a few more instants he saw stephen and Abigail. In front of him, young and beautiful, dressed in garments so white and radiant that they looked more like shrouds of translucent snow, incapable of expressing the sacred emotion, engulfing his soul, soul of Tarsus knelt and began to weep. Brother and sister who had returned to encourage him drew nearer, smiling broadly. Pause for a second again before we listen to the dialogue. Why Abigail and Stephen, who have been following Saul all along, only now appear to him ostensibly? Is this a quiz, Vanessa? Kind of, yeah. But why? Why now and not before? It's the reward of those who found themselves. Not as a simple reward, we're not saying a terrestrial reward, but we're saying now he is in synchronicity and he is clear from the ideas that he had before. He had to voluntarily give up the ego to be in true attunement with those who are guiding him. Some people ask us, I want to see my mentors, I want to talk to spirits and this and that and the other. And we say, but are we open to it? Or are we just like that Buddhist tale, the disciple who came to the Buddhist master and the Buddhist master, let's sit down and have a tea. And, okay, why have you come here? So the master is preparing the tea and put two, two cups for them, boiling the water. And he, the master, is listening. The Buddhist master is listening to the apprentice, the disciple. Oh, master, I have come here because I want to learn from you. I heard this and that and that. He's talking, 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 talking. And as the master is listening, he's pouring water on the cups, listening to the disciple and listening. And the disciple suddenly stops and says, Master, the water is spilling. And he says, yes. If you don't empty the cup of your tea, everything I give to you is going to be spilled out of the cup of tea. Soul of Tarsus needed to empty himself out of the old ideas and ideals to allow the new to visit him. Abigail and Stephen come in young appearances also to represent that the new is visiting soul once he is emptied out of the old. The new cannot stay in 
if we don't empty the cup of our tears, right? Right. So Stephen comes with profound kindness and says, get up, so. What is this you weep, says Abigail, sweetly. Would you feel so discouraged when your task has just begun? Now back on his feet, so wept convulsively. Those tears were not only the relief of a heart forsaken by the world. They were expressions of joy, gratitude to Jesus, of his watch care and benevolence. He wanted to kiss Stephen's hands, to beg for forgiveness, but it was the martyr of the way who, in light of his glorious resurrection, embraced the former rabbi as if so were a beloved brother, Saul. And Stephen kissed his brow and he whispered tenderly, So, do not stay stuck in the past. Who in the world is exempt from wrongdoings? Only Jesus was sinless. Let us do this these days, my friends, and tell one another, do not stay stuck in the past. Who are we to cast a stone? We have all committed wrongdoings. Only Jesus came without any mistake any sin, any whatever we claim it to be. And in a sea of bliss, Saul wanted to speak of his joy, to give thanks, but uncontrollable emotions sealed his lips, confounded his soul. Aided by Stephen, smiling at him in silence, he saw Abigail, more beautiful than ever. She came along and together she spoke to him movingly. We shall never lack a home. Our home shall be in the hearts of all those who came our way. As for children, we have the immense family that Jesus had bequeathed us in his mercy. The children of Calvary are our children too. They are everywhere awaiting their inheritance from the Savior. That's a lesson for us opening our hearts to the universal family. Saul understood the loving admonishment and stored it in the core of his heart. She said, Do not hand yourself over to this enheartment. Our ancestors knew the God of armies, of bloody triumphs, the golden silver of this world. We, however, know the Father who is the Lord of our hearts. The triumphant peace of Jesus lies in the industrious soul that obeys and trusts Him. Experiencing infinite consolation, that's why Jesus is with us. Saul was vexed as not being unable to utter a word. Abigail's exhortations would be with him forever. Never again would he allow discouragement to overwhelm him. And she kept saying, while he was in an ecstasy, he was asking questions in his mind, and she was giving him a recipe not to forget. I think we're going to, as we wrap up the chapter with these words, we're going to meditate for the rest of the day. She says, he asks these questions. New hopes blossomed his heart, but one big question, however, still hovered in his mind. What do we do from here on out to triumph? How to fulfill the sacred notions that feel to him to put into practice without taking note of the sacrifice involved? So, to be sure of victory on the difficult pathway, remember that it's necessary to give Jesus, to give. Jesus gave everything he had and we also need to give. And he was anxious to make the most of the smallest fragment of the glorious fleeting minute. So mentally 
arrayed a large number of questions. What could he do to acquire perfect understanding of Christ's designs? If we want to know of Jesus' designs, what do we do? Abigail gives us the answer, love. You want to understand Jesus' designs? Love. How could we proceed in order to grow richer in divine virtues? What could we do for our soul to reach an elevated expression of Jesus' work? She said, love to understand Jesus' designs, to fulfill them, work. And he asked, what measures could we adopt against such destructive Discouragement when the world frustrates us. Hope, nonetheless. So, to understand Jesus, love. We need to feel. Remember, Jesus said, feel the scriptures. Then, work. Roll the sleeves, serve. And when the world is still challenging, hope, nonetheless. And he kept asking inside of himself, like we do, like we do, same questions. Where was this endless hope? How can we reconcile the great lessons of the gospel with human indifference? And she squeezed his hands tenderly and says, forgive. Here, Saul gives to us an opportunity with Abigail a recipe for the current times and forever. Let us open our hearts in love so we can understand the designs of Christ. Then we serve work. When we are facing challenges, hope nonetheless. And when human indifference creates roadblocks, forgiveness. Love, work, hope forgiveness, love, feeling, work, be industrious, productive, starting in our thoughts, beautiful thoughts. Nature now, says Emmanuel, was at peace. Is that how we feel? We feel more at peace too. Today we were encountering Abigail and Stephen, the representation of a Christ Conscious attitude in life. Recommending to us a new attitude. Let us feel love. Let us work. Let us feel hopeful. And let us forgive always. Beginning with self-forgiveness. My friends, what a joyful moment for all of us. Let us rejoice in the awareness that today... We're stronger than yesterday because we were handed tools for immortality. And tomorrow, as we march towards his first apostolic endeavors, we're going to learn about the productivity of a soul that is now aligned with the Christ consciousness. Much hug to you. Big, big hug. Many kisses. And until tomorrow.